Hi everyone, uh, I'm Eyal and uh, welcome to today's webinar uh, addressing the high cost of Apache Cassandra. Now, more than ever, uh, we are looking for savings on our resources and money. We are living in a fast changing environment that exposes our businesses to challenges. As administrators of database systems, we are looking for cost, we are looking for cost and uh, I said and people said that I cannot hear you cannot hear me well hopefully it's going to be better now okay hopefully it's better uh, as administrator uh, of database systems we are looking for cost saving and stability control with minimum efforts to or changes to our system uh, so let's look how we can achieve these goals with Scylla so first of all, my name is Eyal and I help users deploy Scylla. From sizing the right system to help with data model improvements and to day-to-day -day support requests and questions. So let me show you today's agenda. We will be covering a brief interview uh, review of Scylla. Uh, we'll show you a detailed benchmarks comparisons between Cassandra and Scylla and how that uh, translate to cost implications. The cost of uh, reduction of use, the cost reduction you get when using uh, larger nodes, storage cost benefits of incremental compaction strategy, using workload prioritization to support multiple workloads uh, in a single cluster. A little bit about Scylla DB and our product Scylla, the real time big database. Scylla is a NoSQL drop-in replacement for Apache Cassandra and DynamoDB with superior performance and low latency. By drop-in replacement, we mean the same wire level binary protocol and driver application and applications. In other words, you can use Apache Cassandra driver and DynamoDB API calls with Scylla. Scylla comes in three different flavors. The first one, Scylla open source project. It's available on GitHub and as an RPM or DBM packaging for your own download. We also provide Docker and AMI images if you're using AWS. Scylla Enterprise, the second flavor, is a closed source product. Uh, it's based on the open source core with additional features around security and cluster management capabilities. And the last one is Scylla Cloud, which is a database as a service and managed by Scylla engineers, it is based on Scylla Enterprise deployments. Scylla DB, the company, is getting close to 100 employees and it, they are located around the world. Let's jump at it immediately. We many times claim that Scylla provides unprecedented efficiency. Now, I know that you are thinking these are Scylla's marketing slides and messages to convey a wishful outcome. Here, you see a slide presented by one of our customers, Comcast. Comcast is able to reduce its server footprint by more than 90%. Indeed, the servers used in the large deployment use smaller CPU and disk drivers. We will discuss in this webinar why this is the case for many Cassandra deployments. Actually, when Comcast contacted us, the main goal was not to reduce the total cost of ownership, of the database system. Comcast was trying to solve a latency and cache synchronization issues. Comcast had varnish cache servers in front of their Cassandra deployment. These cache servers require synchronization and handling. Once Comcast switched to Scylla, without changing the application code, the latency jumpiness and cache synchronization problems was over. The next phase, was to reduce the footprint and consolidate the servers into one larger, into larger machines. The outcome of switching to Scylla is 53% reduction in server expenses. But there is more than server cost saving here. Consider the operational savings on the difference between managing almost 1,000 servers versus managing only 78. If you ever had the to apply a patch or any changes to an operating system, think about the planning and the time-consuming operations needed to, to deploy this patch. The operational cost can be staggering with multiple engineers and system to be occupied with this small patch. 
Now consider how costly it can be if you need to upgrade the actual database system. We will deep dive into how Scylla saves capital and operational expenses in this webinar. So let's do now a few poll questions just to get us warmed up. So hopefully you can see the poll questions. Okay, so if you're using Cassandra today, what is the biggest challenge? You can do multiple choices here when you do those. One, operational complexity, finding the talent consultants to manage clusters, cost of support or contracts consult consultants. Maybe you don't have any issues with Cassandra deployments. The next question is, what is your next database deployment platform? Are you going to be doing those on premise? You will self-manage those de deployments. Maybe you're going to be using a cloud while you manage the database system. Maybe you're going to be using database as a service. Or maybe you don't have any plans for new deployments at all. I'll give you a few seconds to answer those questions. Basically, those questions help us a plan for better content in the future and make sure that we are targeting the right products. Thank you very much, guys, for answering those questions. I will close the poll now. Okay, let's continue. In many Cassandra deployments, the main challenge is node sprawl. You might be proud that you maintain thousands of servers in your Cassandra deployments. I'm pretty sure that your chief financial officer is less enthusiastic about it. The common practice calls for one engineer for every 40 to 50 servers you manage. Moreover, the system which requires specialty workers, the cost of engineers can double and triple based on their expertise and level of experience. The other option would be forcing you into high retainer cost of consultant. So it's expensive to maintain a node sprawl. You might say, okay, I will have small clusters. Will that work? For some time, it might. Small Cassandra cluster will handle it. Over time, you will find out that the savings in the usage of small specialized cluster costs you greatly in the waste of resources. You will have clusters which will be sitting idle for large parts of the day, consuming power and uh, AC systems while getting you zero return on the investment. The node sprawl is originated from Cassandra's architecture and limitation on storage capacity per node. We have spoken many times about the limitations of the two terabyte per node. It means if you have a large data set, you have to deploy more nodes to achieve the storage requirement. If you would like to have stronger resiliency in your system, you will need to increase the replication factor of data and again, deploy more nodes. As we said, Cassandra nodes can hold a limited amount of data. And if you need more space to store the, your data, you just, as we said here in the quote, just add more nodes. The outcome is overspending of, of an inf infrastructure, many small nodes with limited amount of storage. You spend more time on configuration and maintenance procedure. You need to buy management tools that can support the wide deployment, install, and have more monitoring agents on those nodes and so on and so forth. You end up with lower mean time to failure, which reflects in less stable system due to the increased number of components. So your system becomes more fragile. To avoid these complexities, users have often added specialized system to support their use cases. For example, caches in front of databases as we have seen in Comcast. All these efforts and resources are invested in order to solve deficiencies in the way Cassandra is implemented. Kind of a waste of time and money. Let's look how another user of Scylla solved the node sprawl issue. As we have seen, the node sprawl is hurting users implementing their system on Cassandra. Kiwi, which is an online travel retailer and aggregator, was a good, exa good example for it initially using bare metal servers. 
and later on using Google Compute Platform for Scylla deployments. The usage of Scylla saved Kiwi over 60% in hardware cost. As you can see, Kiwi expenditure on servers was almost uh, quadruple uh, versus the Scylla ones. But look at the number of servers reduction. In the Comcast case, you might say it was easy to reduce from 1,000 servers. Okay, there might be a, enough fat in there. Here with Kiwi, we can see that even deployments that might be considered efficient with Cassandra can be optimized. And the savings are significant. The money savings are going directly to the bottom line of the organization, as it, it is a direct operational cost if you're using, for example, a GCP deployment. Now, it is not only the hardware cost, as we said. Think about the maintenance cycles and the probability of failure. Taking into account the number of components you have in the systems and the probability of failure. The larger the system is, the mean time, between, mean time to failure is shorter. Require the system administrators to deploy more nodes and, save more, and have more staff to maintain the working system. We created the benchmark that shows the benefits of Scylla. Let me walk you through the process. We set an SLA which represents the throughput requirement and a target latency of 99 percentile for those queries. The benchmark approach is to set application requirements to, and build a system that can achieve these goals from a direct cost of ownership, not taking into account any of the goals of uh, of set system, we see that there are 2.5 times cost reduction when using Scylla. This is from the pure view of AWS bill. Now let's look at the system detail, uh, the system and uh, the results in details. As you can see, the setup includes machines that are adequate for each solution. The i3 metal, a pretty beefy machine for Scylla, and the i3 Forex lodges for Cassandra. If you open the link in the previous slide that I, I've shown, and you'll get the slides at the end of this recording, you will be able to see also that we, were, we have invested a lot of time in optimizing the Cassandra settings, okay? Making sure that we use the right garbage collection system, we use the G1 GC, and the heap sizes settings, the compactor numbers, and different settings that are adequate to make sure that Cassandra meets as, as much as possible uh, those requirements. We really try to make sure that Cassandra is well configured to, to best serve uh, this workload as we defined it. We use the Cassandra stress tool to create the workload on the system. We have used multiple loading systems to make sure that we are not clogging on the stress instance and that the, stre the stress is inflicted on the system and not on the client. So you'll see uh, a lot of stress uh, systems in this benchmark. Again, making sure that we are stressing the, the servers, not the client in, uh, instances. Here are the results. In this chart, we describe the latency results as can be seen for different workloads. Looking at the topmost charts, we see the read and write latencies for the 300,000 operations per second uh, workload. The results show that the Cassandra system does not meet the initial premise of less than 10 milliseconds for the 300,000 operations per second. Yes, we could have added more nodes to the Cassandra system to achieve the needed latency, which would have increased the gap in the TCO even further. However, we could see that there's some hope that in the middle two charts of the 200,000 operation per second, Cassandra was able to meet the SLAs for the right workload, which is expected for, for a right uh, most system, while failing on the read side to meet the SLA. Scylla, on the other hand, meet the SLAs for the 200,000 operations per second with room to grow. At the 300,000 operation seconds per second, the right SLA, again, as expected, are met. While we are slightly above the 10 millisecond latency for the 300,000 operations per second. For the 100,000 operations, uh, 100, operations per second, both systems meet the SLA requirement with no problem. Now, do not forget 
that Cassandra system is already 10 times bigger in terms of node count and still cannot meet that SLA. From a TCO perspective, this result represents the following. Your application, when using Scylla, can serve three times the number of users and still meet the needed SLA before you need to think about increasing the number of servers for the Scylla deployment. Again, it's simple. You can handle peak traffic. Think about, for example, holiday times if you're a retailer or increase website traffic if you're a news outlet while not worrying about the tight capacity due to increased cost. We've also added here the tail end latencies, the 99.9%. These latencies represent the user experience when the system is totally overwhelmed. It is again clear that if you're gonna use Cassandra for these uh, use cases or times when you're really exceeding everything you had, it is not an acceptable latency anymore. Half a second to get a response from a database is not an option. Well, with Scylla, even in the 99 percentile, at least for the writes, you still meet the SLAs, which is an extremely different um, plane to be on. Now, looking deeper at Scylla performance during the benchmark, we can see how Scylla provides a very steady, steady and, const, and consistent operations per second while maintaining those latency SLAs. The top graphs represent the load on the Scylla cluster. The top right and bottom right graphs show Scylla is able to meet the throughput SLA, in this case, the 200K, and the left-hand graph on the top chart shows the, the load on the CPU Scylla, on the CPU in the Scylla servers. You see the peaks in the CPU, but not in the user experience. These peaks are coming from Scylla's compaction processes, most likely. Many Cassandra users are looking for a magic wand to prevent compactions to happen during their peak traffic times. With Scylla, you don't need to worry about that. We can handle it without inflicting the pain on your customers. The impact of compactions on the system are minimal, as can be seen in the latency graph at the bottom of the chart. You have the average, the 95 percentile, and the 99 percentile graphs there. The latency changes are minimal, and measured in a handful of milliseconds for the 99 percentile under max load and the compaction load increasing that load on the servers. Which means the changes in latency are contained within the latency budget we have defined for the set user experience of this example, 200,000 operations per second. So a well-sized system can and should handle the user uh, or what we call the front-end workload, as well as the back-end office, for example, the compaction operations, backup and restore, node addition and replacement, without hurting the user-defined experience. To summarize, we are in control of the user experience under maximum traffic and the operational load, which is the, the expectation from any database system. Again, let's summarize it. The actual benchmark, the cost is 2.5 cheaper. There is at least 10X reduction in administrative cost and overhead. The P99 latencies that we have defined are at least 45, uh, 40, up to 45 times better. Again, Cassandra could not handle, as we have defined the SLAs for the 200K and 300K cases we provide you a higher ag uh, agility of the system and resiliency of that because we provide you 10 times higher uptime or what we called the mean time to failure. Scylla again is automatically tuned. So if you install Scylla, you will be able to see that it's automatically tuned to its system without different configurations you have to put in. So if availability and real time is important for your business, Scylla should be your, cho your choice of system. Let's talk now how Scylla offers you density in data storage without compromising availability and data resiliency. In some use cases, you are required to have to store an ample amount of data. These use cases not always require high, higher compute resources. So you're torn apart. 
Okay, you have to put a lot of servers if you do want to use Cassandra because you need a, a lot of storage. With Scylla, you're given the option to use fewer nodes while still storing terabytes of data. For example, if you add storage on, uh, you can add storage to your nodes and then you don't have to add more compute, memory, or network resources, and then saving you money. As we previously discussed, Cassandra is limiting the amount of data you can store in the node. For Cassandra, the, the steering process is challenging. So for example, if you have to replace a node, it costs you a lot of time and money as it involves data writes and reach, which will trigger different, different backend processes, such as compaction and cleanup. To mitigate the performance impact in those nodes, Cassandra, by default, limits the streaming amount throughput to 25 megabytes, okay? This is another reason why they bounded to two ter terabytes per node, which will take you roughly 12 hours to stream in optimal condition. If you consider streaming a four terabyte node, it becomes irrele irrelevant with Cassandra. Look at the top chart here. With Scylla, you are not limited by the software. Scylla is able to stream data at a line speed, as you can see. The only item that sets the speed of, the, uh, of a node rebuild is the hardware. And as the hardware scales, so does the Scylla density you can use without worrying about the time to rebuild the node. So it's always gonna be attached to the actual size of the uh, storage throughput, network capacity, CPU ability to drive the data. The bottom graph shows that operationally, still has no limitations on, on, on the pace of data throughput when you write in. This is the compaction IOQ. And Scylla is able to handle the data throughput at line rate, eight gigabyte per second, which is 64 gigabit per second. Let's look at actual storage utilization with Scylla. Incremental compaction strategy is a new feature that is available in Scylla Enterprise 2019.1. The idea be behind incremental compaction strategy is to cross the 50% disk utilization which Cassandra imposes when using size tier compaction strategy. Size tier compaction strategy is the default compaction strategy, which offers a good balance for writes and read workloads. Incremental compaction strategy offers the same benefits in terms of read and write workload agility while offering the user to increase disk utilization. Let's talk to an example. As you can see in the graph, for roughly 600 gigabyte of actual storage usage, you will need 1.4 terabyte of disk space for size tier compaction strategy, which is represented with a green colored line. The disk cons consumption spikes are more violent in the case of size tier, size tier compared to the Scylla's incremental compaction strategy, which means less data is written to the SSDs. The benefits are twofold. One, you have more disk space. You can utilize the disk up to 80% of its capacity without any concern. Second, you have less writes going into your disk, which increases their life expectancy and requires you to re replace them less often. As the time of compaction is related to the amount of data, you can see that the actual compaction workload is reduced and provides users with the smoother operational uh, experience. Both the disk space and the workload smoothness are translated to reduce cost of ownership. You need less disks, your disk operate longer with less probability of fall failure, and your system resources are used to serve clients, not backend office processes. Let's look how more optimizations are av available with Scylla Enterprise. Workload prioritization. Workload prioritization allow users to combine multiple use cases into a single operational cluster. Your business unit defines its target workload and latency budget. As an operator, you combine all workloads into a single working cluster. Many users will jump and say, hey, 
many Cassandra users will jump and say, hey, one workload can cause reduced operations on the other use cases as they are not isolated in the cluster. And that is again true for Cassandra. When you operate this workload with Scylla's enterprise workload prioritization, you can combine them into a single cluster without compromising your SLAs. How do we do it? Very simple. We set each workload to a predefined maximum portion, portion of the cluster resources. So we take the cluster and we divide it into set defined sets. As long as the cluster is underutilized, the workload can consume as much resources as, as it needs. Now, when the other workloads are added to the cluster with their own predefined maximum portion of resources, each workload cannot exceed its fair share of the system, guaranteeing the throughput and latency budget provided to the application. If you have sized the cluster properly, and again, we are happy to help with any sizing uh, requirements you might have. It means that you can combine multiple workloads into a single operational cluster, when each cl workload is guaranteed with at least a fair share of its resources. The TCO aspect is clear. We can have many use cases. It does not mean we have to build many clusters to serve the use cases. Operators, um, you know, when, they're source, they, when they are sourcing servers, they are fully, that are fully utilized and they provide their business value to your application. Not just sit there idle consuming power. Workload prioritization is a great way, for you, great way for you to consolidate cluster and workloads. And again, decreasing your operational cost and increasing your server utilization with again, translating it to money in your pocket. Using a cloud-based solution is a popular way to reduce cost. Most users will be using infrastructure as a service system, meaning using provision servers from cloud providers such as Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and others. Cloud vendors also offer managed databases as well. DynamoDB and Google's Bigtable, which are the grandfathers of Scylla, are among the popular ones. Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure also offer Cassandra compatible services. The benefits of managed services are clear. There is no operational learning curves. You do not need to learn how to manage a database. The cloud vendors manage the cluster for you. Backups, upgrade, maintenance, all these workloads are no longer part of your challenges. Uh, you buy what you need, no more, no less. You provision capacity, at least this is the promise. You provision, provision capacity as it adequates to your requirements from SLA and so on and so forth. The speed of provisioning, the cloud vendor provision the capacity for you. You, do, you, you, know, you don't need to deal with 10 procurement processes for hardware operating system and so on and so forth and you don't need to hire consultants. You get a true one-stop shop for your database. There are some disadvantages as well. You lose some buying power. The more services you buy from a cloud vendor, the more locked in you are into the service. There are some hidden costs. You should know that some cloud vendors charge for intra DC traffic. So you are not only paying for traffic coming and going from the cluster, but you also pay for traffic among the nodes. Uh, and with data replications, such charges can be significant. And additional charges might be required for security features, firewalls, encryption, and so on. To certain industries, cloud vendors security measures are not enough and then preventing them to use the cloud services another disadvantage if you're are your application locations and you have to make sure that latencies are kept in line so you need to place the application close to the database service which means that your cloud vendor must have a data center in the region your business is serving and the fifth again is cost the service comes at the premium sometimes a hefty one Users typically start with a small deployment, which means a reasonable cost. However, as time goes, and so does the increased usage, and CFOs get a nice invoice from the cloud vendor. How big? Let's look at the next slide. Here you see a comparison of three DBAS options. AWS Cassandra Managed Service, Azure Cosmos, and Scylla Cloud. 
Scylla Cloud is offered as a full managed service to any user who wants to use it. The prices information here was sourced three days ago, and we used both AWS managed Cassandra service and Azure Cosmos um, with higher consistency level for reads. For AWS, we use the provision capacity, which means that you're committed to the servers and it costs 33% less than on demand. For the Cosmos offering, we adjusted the on demand to be 33% lower to meet the same requirements. Payloads used in this case are two kilobytes payload. Larger payloads will favor Scylla even more as the number of reads and writes units is linearly linked to the size of your payload. So the more payload you have, the increased cost is coming in. So with larger payloads, users are required to purchase more and more read and write units. Well, with Scylla, again, the price is not changing based on the payload as long as you have sized it properly. And again, we are happy to help you with any sizing. For indexes, both AWS and Azure charges extra read and write units. The pricing above represents a single index. Again, Scylla does not charge for extra, extra additional indexes. AWS does not have a multi-DC deployment capabilities while Azure and Scylla does. AWS and Azure do not provide latency SLA. So with Scylla, your latency requirements are again baked into the sizing. And with Azure and AWS, you have to do the try and error until you actually meet your business requirements. Scylla provides at cost, the instances, the software licenses, as well as premium support capabilities. So again, at a fraction of the cost, you get the whole package, fully managed service, less limitation, no hassles. To summarize, everything. We have shown how users like Comcast and Kiwi are able to save big dollars on their deployment with Scylla. Benchmark shows time after time how we provide 10x reduction in the number of nodes. And using larger nodes is not an issue if you are using the right system resources when you build them. Compaction should not be worrying. And again, they're even smoother with, IC, with incremental compaction strategy. Using advanced features such as workload prioritizations, will help you combine different workloads into fewer clusters, saving you money and operational cost. With Scylla, you're able to reduce your TCO. We have shown you also that you can use both managed, self-managed system, as well as fully managed system with Scylla and still have a lower cost when you deploy your clusters. Now, let's do one more um, poll and then I will answer your question. If you can give us feedback on um, this session, for example, what were your expectations? Is it too technical, less technical, as expected? Was expecting a little bit more business perspective? Whatever come to your mind, feel free to put in. Again, helping us improve our content as well. I'll give you guys another 30 seconds. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. And a couple of things. Uh, if you're interested in evaluating your current workloads or you want something uh, to know more about Scylla or you want some technical evaluation session with me or my teams, there is a web a link here. Don't copy the link, you'll get the slides. Or you can email me directly if you have any questions. Again, we will send the links and the recording and the slides along with an email after this session. And with that, I will go to the questions and answers. So 
Again, uh, the first question I have here, are these comparisons based on the open source versions of Scylla and Cassandra? The answer to that is yes. Uh, the, all the numbers that you've seen, the comparison that we did, does not involve anything like the uh, workload prioritization or the ICS. It's all pure open source versus open source. So there, so there are no differences. You can replicate the um, benchmark. Actually, you will see in the link that we will send you that you can go in, download all the information, and redo the benchmark yourself and see if those results replicate, for example, with your own data model. Um, another question I got is, what would you recommend users deploying on virtual environments such as VMware? So VMware is, is a good uh, example for deployment of uh, Scylla systems. Uh, we have seen users doing that, um, using VMware. One thing I would be uh, asking you to do when you deploy on VMware is, A, understand exactly which types of um, instances you're getting from your administrators. We ask that you minimize the over-provisioning of CPUs and memories, and also make sure that the I.O. capabilities in terms of throughput and latencies are set for continuous IOPS and what is the bandwidth limitations you will be having for each one of those VMs. So again, there's a few considerations you should take into account here and make sure that those are met uh, to your likening. If you have more questions like that, again, email me. I'll be happy to answer those questions. Uh, second one, are there any Cassandra settings you can recommend for efficient deployment? Um, the answer to that is yes. Again, going back to that benchmark that we published, if you go into that one, you will see all the settings that we have used for this specific type of instances, the i3 Forex lodges. Um, and again, there is a bunch of uh, settings that you have to deploy, the garbage collection, the compactors, the amount of memory, the caching, the disk type, SSD versus not SSD, and so on and so forth. Those settings are there. You can take them and, and, and deploy them with your Cassandra. However, I would recommend you do that. You do Scylla. Uh, five lines of configuration, that's all you need to care about. And all of those five lines are automatically set with Scylla, so you don't have to deal, deal with those um, configuration settings. Um, another question that I have here is, what would you recommend for 70% um, read and 30% write workloads in terms of compaction strategy? Great question. So I talked about the size tier compaction. Um, with Cassandra, some people will tell you to use level compaction strategy. It is correct that for pure read workloads, level compaction strategy is great. Uh, however, there is a right amplification going in with level compaction. And though that level compaction strategy will cause you some, uh, can cause you some right amplification, so you have to make sure that you have enough I.O. Uh, with Scylla, to be honest, uh, we have uh, controllers within the system that make sure that we do not overwhelm uh, the servers with the compaction processes. So again, we have seen users using size tier compaction strategy. Uh, with 70, 30, even higher uh, ratios of read writes um, perfectly well and not suffering from any uh, read latencies challenges. Another one that I have is what would you say would be the average cost saving for moving from my Cassandra cluster in AWS to Scylla DB? So if you're, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take two, two items here. If you're looking to self manage the cluster, uh, meaning that you're going to go with uh, either Scylla Open Source or Scylla Enterprise. With Scylla Open Source, we will typically see a reduction of, again, 3x, 4x, sometimes 7x in terms of cost. It really depends on how efficient or, in or inefficient is your Cassandra deployment. And we have seen, again, a different versions of that. If you're going to try to use the same small instances with Scylla, Basically, what will happen is you're going to be limited to the small instances. I will ask you to increase the size of the instance so the benefits will be greater in that regard. I will also say if you're going to be using Scylla Cloud, which then we will take care of all the managed service, you will find out that the actual TCO is extremely beneficial for you in terms of actual expenditure of cost on consultants and or staff 
uh, and you can re repurpose those staff costs to, for example, develop your own application. Scylla Cloud is an extremely efficient uh, system. It is today deployed on AWS. So if you are already on AWS, we will offer you a VPC peering. So everything is still within your uh, security group and you can deploy your cluster uh, that way. Again, Scylla Cloud will be, uh, I would argue, the best way to get the TCO. And as you saw in my slides, um, we're talking about somewhere between eight to 10X reduction in actual cost. This is direct money in the bank. Uh, one more question I have here. Um, are there any uh, data model changes between Scylla and Cassandra? The answer to that is no. Um, but I would say one thing I would ask you to do is ch change the drivers. So if you're using uh, the Apache Cassandra Java driver or the Go driver, Scylla today provides those drivers that are what we call shard aware. They are more efficient. They make sure that the workload is even more evenly distributed across the cluster, and they provide your servers, your seal servers, a more smooth, a smoother operation. So again, I would ask you to choose the Scylla drivers. However, if you still want to stick with the Cassandra, Apache Cassandra uh, drivers, that's fine. We will continue to support them. But again, I would again recommend you to use the Scylla uh, provider drivers, which are 100% from the application perspective compatible with what you have now. You should not change anything in your application. Oh, okay. What can be the maximum size of Cassandra table in gigabytes, above which it leads to performance issues while reading large volumes of data? Uh, tricky question. Um, I would argue there is no limit uh, in gigabytes. We have seen tables that are terabytes of size in Scylla. Um, that's something that, uh, again, it's something that uh, we see day in, day out. Um, reading large volume of data now comes into a different space. How do you read the data? How did you model the data? For example, if you do a full table scans, how do you do those table scans? We, for example, recommend you do that in a, in a token aware view. And there is a nice blog that was written by our CTO, Avi Kiviti, on how to do a full table scan. And there's an additional one that wrote by Botond. I will make sure that if you Google uh, table scan on Scylla, you will find those. Uh, there are other things that you want, want to, to look um, into when you do those table scans or big tables is how much time you delete, how many of those records are being deleted constantly. Uh, what think Cassandra people talk about, tombstones. Uh, again, Scylla has a very efficient compaction process, so the whole tombstone problem is less uh, available to your eyes, and in most cases, completely uh, obscured, obscured. You don't see those. And uh, you have to set your, what we call the GC grace period to a predefined system. I would recommend you contact us. We can look at the data model using the size of the tables that you want to use. Again, I've seen terabyte size tables working with no problem. Uh, more questions that I see here is, is there a C++ Scylla driver available beside the Apache? Unfortunately, no. I know that it sounds a little bit awkward, but we have not released a C++ driver and we should do that uh, in the near future. Uh, another question is, does Scylla use more efficient as a stable format? Will Scylla reduce disk footprint? Um, yes and no. Um, we use the same MC file format. So those SS tables provide you two things. One, it provides, it guarantees that you are backward compatible with systems, A, B, if tomorrow, for some reason, you don't like us and you want to move back to your Apache Cassandra, you can do that with no additional cost. In terms of efficiency, we today support the MC file format, which is pretty efficient uh, file format. Again, with ICS, the enterprise version uh, that we have, you can have a bigger size um, uh, utilization of disk and then reduce the cost of ownership. Um, how much change is required from the development application and if I want to, uh, my development team to switch from Apache Cassandra to open source Scylla? Uh, the answer to that is very little, if any. 
today with a patch with the Scylla 3.3 version open source and of the upcoming 4.0 there are no gaps so if you want to use for example lightweight transaction CDC um, any type of uh, changes uh, that you have inside your uh, Cassandra Apache Cassandra systems you can take your application and directly target it into the Scylla cluster and I would urge you to do that take the application and point the connection method to the Scylla cluster and fire away you should see no differences in the application still working I hope and I'm pretty sure that you will see a benefits in the uh, performance gap and performance uh, results you'll get there again using the right hardware and sending it cover um, um, the right settings in the in the system I would ask you even if it's an open source we have uh, a slack open source channel subscribe to it ask your questions there go for it if you decide you want to go with the enterprise we have a bunch of solution architects will be happy to help you deploy the right system with the right sizing and make sure if you need for example to have a more efficient data model something that we also offer uh, hey you have this data model and we can help you out uh, improving it and then making it more efficient so this is the question and I think this is the last question I had to answer if there are any more questions I'm gonna wait here for another minute oh a couple of more nice okay uh, I have a few table each having around three to five billion records in Oracle database um, need to bring that table to Cassandra worried about performance problem while reading after moving these tables to Cassandra excellent um, so couple of things if you're using Oracle and one thing you'll have to think about is denormalizing your data so if you are coming from a relational database as long as you for example I used to use foreign keys doing some joins you'll have to somehow somewhat change your mindset uh, you'll have to take those tables and in general think about each table as a query so think about the query that you want to ask and then pose that question as a table meaning what am I querying for what is the order of data I'm querying for all these items will have to be calculated in the creation of the table we have done multiple uh, use cases of moving from relational uh, database into Scylla uh, I don't know which one are public or not um, but there if you look in our use cases there are at least a couple that I remember that move completely from relational to Scylla in one in one jump uh, we have seen movements from from or relational to Cassandra or from relational to Mongo and then to Scylla that is a, a more I would argue a more common path uh, we do see lately more and more customers jumping from a relational database into Scylla it does require some thinking and some um, understanding of the uh, the data model there is no I want to repeat this three to five billion records it's not a huge data set it's a pretty uh, common data set numbers of, of uh, records that we see in Scylla so that should not worry you hopefully I answered all right Any more question? Thank you guys. Thank you guys for everything. Uh, I really appreciate your time and I want to thank you. Stay in touch with me, send me emails, ask your questions. We will send you the recording of this webinar as long along with uh, uh, any information that we have here, the links and so on and so forth. Um, stay in touch. Uh, there are more webinars on our website. Subscribe and we'll be happy to see you there again. Thank you very much.